we've looked at the fish and we've asked the fish what's what's happening and the, the fish are telling us a story uh, now we need to fill in the missing middles and the missing middles were uh, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton so by having some dedicated work uh, that the Salmon Foundation is sponsoring to do some more detailed work on the phytoplankton and the zooplankton uh, hopefully we can fill these gaps and link it back to the fish and I think that's one of the strength of the Salish Marine Survival Project is that it's trying to look from the physics to the phytoplankton all the way up to the fish to the potential predators as uh, factors that contribute to their survival. And, but the main focus is really to understand why survival is currently as low as it is. So to look at the decline we need to look at historical data uh, because that's the only way to explain uh, when these declines or what happens during these declines. So what we're trying to do instead is look at stocks that are doing very well and stocks that are doing very poor and trying to see why are the stocks are doing well, why they're doing well and, and looking at the stocks that are doing poorly and why they're doing poorly and maybe that can explain uh, maybe some of the changes that have happened in the past to explain the decline. We're looking in part as to what they eat so just uh, opening up their stomachs and identifying what it is that they eat. We also do a series of chemical analyses to look at their health. Uh, and in particular, we're looking at fats in the fish to see how much fat they have, but also the type of fat that they have. And we also look at a bone in the head of the fish called the ear bone, which is a bit like a tree. So when you polish it, you see some rings ha uh, appearing on, on the uh, ear bone. And from that, we can tell how long the fish has been in the ocean, how fast it's been growing. Uh, and we can compare this to when the fish came out to see, uh, again, if it was the early migrant or the late migrant that survived. For me, what the, the main thing that we've seen over the last few years is that herring is a major prey for Chinook and Coho salmon. When they feed on young herring, they appear to be growing fast and surviving better. So one of the key thing in my mind to understand what's going on with Chinook salmon and coho salmon in the Strait of Georgia is to look at what's going on with the herring and what were the factors that contributes to the variability in, in the herring abundance but also perhaps to their decline. Whether or not this is a reduction in kelp beds where some of the herrings were spawning historically or to some other factors. So l looking at how the ecosystem has changed uh, all the way up to, to salmon. The herring story is probably one of the most useful one here because it allows us to better explain uh, change in survival. Now we, at least overall for the Strait of Georgia. So we're working also with some colleagues in the US uh, where we're looking at growth hormones in juvenile salmon. And we're seeing some interesting patterns within the Strait of Georgia, seeing uh, in particular we're seeing uh, better growth in the northern part of the Strait of Georgia compared to the southern part. But uh, we're also seeing some differences, for instance, on the east side versus the west side of Texada Island. And what we're also seeing is there, there are some differences uh, between years. So, for instance, in 2012 and 2014, there was better growth uh, for juvenile coho than in 2013. And uh, the interesting part here is, is uh, at least the belief was, uh, during even years, we have a large number of smolts of, of pink salmon coming down from the Fraser River, and there was some belief that these pink salmon would be competing with co salmon, so that would be more noticeable in even years compared to the odd years. But what we're seeing is the opposite: the co salmon seems to be doing better in odd year, in even years, sorry, compared to odd years, at least in terms of growth, and that is related also to the. Uh, cyclical abundance of, of herring that we've seen as well. One of the uh, thing that we are trying to understand is is whether or not the timing at ocean entry is important for these fish uh, and if it is important then we can inform uh, hatcheries as to when to release the fish to maximize their uh, the survival of the fish that we release for instance. Uh, the other one that will uh, come out is once we work with the herring folks tr trying to see to what extent the abundance of adult herring affect the survival or the production of young of the year herring. And if there's a link there, then at least you can inform managers in terms of how much uh, herring you could potentially harvest uh, or not harvest to make sure that there's enough uh, young fish for the salmon to feed on when they, they come into the ocean. If we don't do this, what will happen is we'll have a series of missing middles. 
uh, where we think what's going on without really knowing what's going on. So having all these studies done at the same time, at least we can have all those pieces of the puzzles done at the same time. Otherwise, we have a piece of one puzzle here, a piece of one puzzle here, and you don't know how well they're connected.